Turn to Genesis 29. Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. What we're going to be looking at here is a love story. Some of you have commented on my comments about Hallmark movies. And, and you know, it's interesting on TV because, you know, a love story, it has this happy ending. But in our own lives, whether it's love stories or just a desire for um, connection, to be um, known by other people, to, to, to be able to, to be in a spot where, um, you know, you feel welcome and accepted can often be a, a difficult thing. I remember when I was in, in high school, um, we have this thing called prom, which is this dance, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Well, there's this one key aspect about prom, which makes sometimes things difficult, and that is you have to find someone to go with. And so I had asked someone to go with me, and she said no. Yeah, I know. So I went to, <laughs> thank you, that's what I'm looking for here. So we went, and I, I was a part of this little quiz bowl, and a bunch of them were pe people like me, not really socially competent. But we had this one person, and she was kind of in with the in crowd, and she's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to figure this out. And so she kind of made it our little project that we were going to find someone for me to go to prom with. And so they gathered around, and they came up with a name. And so after we had our little thing, and we went, and sometime during that week, I asked this girl, and she said no. <laughs> so I go back, and, uh, you know, we have these matches once a week. And so before our match, we talk about the no, and then what, you know, who the next person should be. Um, we did this five weeks in a row. There were six no's. Um, I, finally, I finally did go to prom, and, and it, was, it was fun. But I think that many of you can imagine that, you know, it's, it's one thing to, like, a no, okay. I mean, you know, there's lots of factors that are involved in that. But oftentimes, when we feel rejected, it kind of heightens this voice that speaks that we are not enough, that you're not enough, that there's something, there's something wrong with you. And um, if you're going to get anything in life, it, you, you have to somehow, you know, manipulate or, or cajole your way to it or, or just simply kind of live in the fact that maybe you're not enough. And, um, and, and that's just the way it is. And I think that's what we see here in, in this account here of, of Jacob and really then Leah. So where are we at in the Bible? Um, the book of Genesis is the first book, and the book of Genesis is divided into two parts. Uh, chapters 1 through 11 is the first part, and we have the four great events. There's creation, fall, flood, and the Tower of Babel. The second part, which is chapters 12 through 50, is the four great men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Here we are in the life of Jacob, and we have seen Jacob he has um, gotten his brother's inheritance and working with his mother has deceived his father into obtaining his blessing. His mom was particularly worried that Esau, his brother, would kill him. And so she said, you have to get out of here. And so she sent him to his uncle's, which is 500 miles away. Now, last week, Ryan preached on this event that happened just as he was starting this journey, this confirmation that the Lord is going to be with him, not just there in Beersheba where he's going from, but, but with him the, the whole way, and even where he's there, and even when he comes back. And so now Jacob has made this journey, and he's finally arrived, and he sees his uncle Laban and his two daughters, Leah and Rachel, and has stayed with them for about a month. And we're going to pick up there in verse 15. A couple things here before we dive in that I just want to help you with as we look at this passage. One is remember that this is Moses writing to those that are entering into the promised land. And so we need, the, the people there probably need assured that, that God is with them. They need to understand how this all came about. But ultimately what God is doing, not only for them, but, but through them. Where is all of this headed? Uh, the next thing I want you to understand is when we see this passage, we see if you have an ESV like I do or another Bible, it might break it up into paragraphs. 
There's a lot of details we don't know about this rather interesting story. It just doesn't say. So what is important is not only what's told in these, but also it's summarized usually there in the last sentence or two of each paragraph. So you may want to pay special attention to that. So with that, Genesis chapter 29, verses 15 to the end. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, you should therefore serve me for nothing. Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Uh, Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served Rachel for uh, seven years for Rachel. But they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Ga Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. <clears throat> Complete the week of this one. And we will give the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also. And he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she, said, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us Oftentimes, our lives are drawn towards stories of, of love, that, that it would be love that would uh, complete the aches in our own soul. But Lord, we want to hear from you. We want you to speak to our heart, which is often in pain. Lord, we ask for your grace in our lives, that, that we might be able to see what it is that you would have for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak, God, through me or even around me. But we ask that this morning we would hear your voice. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the title of this message is The Girl That Nobody Loved. And I, I got the title kind of from this book, The Girl No One Wanted. Um, this is the Jesus Storybook Bible, and we sometimes give this out um, at different times. But uh, it's great for you as adults and for someone that's older. It, it's, there's a couple of books that are like this that I would recommend that would be children's storybooks. It gives you a great overview of the entire Bible that you can have at one setting. Uh, the story here of Leah is one of my favorites. I, I love this picture of Jacob. It's this, when he finds out it was Leah, not Rachel. So if you want to take a look at this book, I, 
I, I do, I recommend it. But the girl that no one loved, in fact, love is kind of a big theme here in this in this passage, and we'll see that there's really three loves. There's uh, Jacob's love, Laban's love, and then Rachel's love. Jacob's love. Jacob loved Rachel. He loved Rachel. That's what it says right here. Verse, 19, verse 15, Jacob, Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what shall your wages be? So Laban had two daughters. They would have been Jacob's cousins. And so Jacob maybe was on his trip to Haran, was reading a lot of Jane Austen, maybe some Pride and Prejudice, and was like, why don't I get married to one of these, my cousins? And so he did. And he had his eye on Rachel. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these women, but what we do know is this, is that Leah had weak eyes. Now, people have said maybe this is something physically wrong with her eyes, or maybe this is just simply a euphemism for she wasn't pretty to look at. We don't kind of know exactly what that is, but the effect is is that um, she was considered unattractive, at least by Jacob. But Rachel, however, um, we have no ambiguity. It says, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance, and the Hebrew is just like the English. She had a, a lovely figure, and she was great to look at, and she's a very pretty face. And so this is the only real detail that we have about Rachel up to this point. Jacob loved Rachel, and he says, I will serve you seven years, verse 16, for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, a lot of commentators say that seven years is, is, a, is a big big bride price. That's a, a, lot of, a lot of service, a lot of money to give, so to speak, um, for this woman. And I don't know really how one judges that. Maybe they found things that were corresponding and did a little bit of math. I'm trying to think, like, it's been a while, but, you know, I think the last person I know paid like 14 months worth for their bride that of a wedding that I did, right? I guess I'd be like 16 months now, right, with inflation. Is that how some of that works? So, obviously we don't do that. But before we get on our high horse, I, you know, this system has the dad, you know, <laughs> asking money for the, for the daughters and is a dad of three daughters. You know, uh, our current system has the dad giving a lot of money, you know, for the daughters. And so, this is kind of an interesting way to do it. In different parts of the world, they still do um, things like this that flows the other way. And I do want to say, even though there are some maybe funny things that we can say and notice here, um, we got to be careful because it's not like the Bible is condoning this behavior. The Bible's not condoning polygamy. It's not condoning um, putting someone into servitude and having them bear children on your behalf. Uh, the Bible is not condoning the way that Laban is treating his daughters or the way that, that Jacob even is conducting himself. And in fact, as we read on from this passage, it just gets much, much worse. And so we need to realize that while the Bible is telling us what did happen, it's actually giving us a, a lot of, of insight as to what sin does. And when we, when we don't do that which God is asking of us, we see the destruction that follows. So its condemnation is implicit here. But Jacob loved Rachel. I don't know if you've ever kind of been infatuated with someone, or that you've been in love like this, where you have someone that's just the focus of your life. There was a time before... Uh, I told Carrie, or Carrie even knew that I had liked her, that I was actually taking a picture of her and her family for them. And so my wife Carrie, she has a sister, uh, Melissa, and then she has her mom and her dad, and then her, and they were standing kind of like that in front of the mantle, right, with her mom and dad in the center. And I was taking a picture, and I was using, it was a film, it was a camera that used film, so for those of you that don't know, but, you know, between us painting on cave walls and digital <laughs> photography, we used film. film. And with film, you don't know what you got until you get it developed, right? So I take these pictures and find. And you'd think, right, how would the pictures turn out? And be centered right with that space in between Carrie's mom and dad's head. That that would be the center, right? Four people, right? But that's not what happened. 
That's not what happened. Instead, dead center in the picture was Carrie. And her sister was almost like out of frame. It's just these pictures are rather funny. And that's what, I mean, that's kind of what love does, right? That's what love does. Is That's your focus. That's delightful. But with Jacob, it, it's kind of emphasized in a very crude way. At the end of his seven years, he says very abruptly to his father-in-law that he's ready to be married. But he doesn't, he doesn't talk about, you know, we just, we, we connect emotionally. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to really walking hand in hand on the beach with my soulmate and my best friend, where we share experiences, we jointly enjoy beauty, and we imagine a future together. Instead, the Bible says, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. And there is an abrupt and rather crude kind of focus here for what Jacob really wants. You know, and the pursuit of pleasure can oftentimes lead us to destructive places. And we'll actually see that here in the passage. Jacob loved Rachel. What does Laban love? Laban loves, well, Laban loves money. Laban loves money. We see it here. It gets drawn out a little bit more the more and more we know Laban. And he's pretty sneaky about it. So Jacob does say what he says. And so Laban's like, okay, fine, it's time. And so he gathers a feast and we're going we're gonna to get this done. Everyone's there. And then at the last moment, he switches Rachel for Leah. Now you may be wondering, how does this happen? Like, how does this happen? Well, I don't know. But let me just say, they didn't have electricity. So it's like super dark. You know, she's wearing a veil. There's probably a little, little drinky drinky, you know, that was going on. Um, it was probably absolutely pitch black in the tent where they were at. And from what we know of Jacob, he had one thing on his mind. But when it came morning, it wasn't Rachel. It was Leah. It was Leah. Jacob didn't know until the morning what had happened. And Jacob says a line that we see many times here in the book of Genesis. What is this that you have done? What is this that you have done? And I think the only reason that, that Jacob didn't go out and just kill Laban was because of Laban's response. He says then, um, why did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban says this. He goes, it is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Now, I don't know how true that is, and it's probably partially true, but it was really somewhat of a, re a rebuke, I think, to Jacob. Jacob, what, remember how you tricked your brother? <laughs> what comes around goes around. What comes around goes around. You played that game. I'll play that game too. Get ahead. That's probably why Jacob was willing to do the additional seven years. That's probably why Jacob was probably somewhat chastened by this deception. The deceiver has now been deceived. Laban is interested in another seven years. Again, we already said a rather large price, and yet now it's being doubled. Laban seemed perfectly okay to give both his daughters to the same man. And it concludes here with the fact that he actually did serve Laban another seven years. Now, let's just talk about Laban for a moment. There's a little saying that has served me well in my life, and that is this, is that people are funny when it comes to death and money. People are funny when it comes to death and money. Um, perfectly normal people, when faced with death of themselves or some, you know, they're their impending death or the death of a loved one might act in a peculiar way. And same is true as if whenever it involves money. 
people's lives. I know of two people, they were very good friends, but an argument over $20 has meant that they haven't talked to each other in over 30 years. Well, people are funny when it comes to money. I, many of you may know of situations where the parents both pass away and the siblings, who seemingly have gotten along fairly decently throughout life, suddenly are at odds with one another because of the inheritance, trying to get ahead, feeling slighted, maybe never speaking to one another ever again because of money, because of money. And here, here Laban is looking for the security that he thinks he'll find in wealth. Which brings us then to our last love, and that's Leah. And really what Leah loves is being loved, something that she hasn't really experienced. Verse 31 says that when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So here is this unloved woman, um, complicit, but yet <laughs> somehow in this whirlwind of this plan, and now she's married to this guy, and she thinks my way out is by proving myself by having children. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, now my husband will love me. So let's just think about this for a moment. She's hated by her husband. And she says, you know what? If he just, if his eyes were opened to how valuable I am, if he would just understand that I'm producing for him an heir, then he has to love me. I have now painted him into a corner where his affections will surely flow out. And it sounds silly when we say it out loud, but of course that's not the voice she's listening to, is it? Not only does she think that, but she names the kid Reuben, which means see a son. Every time Jacob calls for the boy, she's hoping that he'll be reminded that he should be loving her. That, that she's the one that should have his heart. When that doesn't happen, she has another child, Simeon, which kind of sounds like he hears, like the Lord has heard. So if she can't get it relationally, she's going to try and, you know, say spiritually you should love me, right? There's a spiritual reason here. When that doesn't work, she, she doubles down on her desperation, calling her third son Levi, which is kind of like the Hebrew word attached, meaning you should be attached to me. And this has been Leah's life. And if we can just imagine for a moment where Leah is at. Jacob's probably not the only one that has found her sister more attractive. She's in a situation where it's perfectly fine for the parents to switch her out on her sister's wedding night. She goes along with the idea. And now here she is, naming her kids in such a way as to be a constant reminder to her husband that, she should be, that he should be loving her. It's a very sad position. She is the girl that nobody wanted. She is the girl that nobody loved. And yet God saw her. He saw this girl and her crazy schemes and her de desperation to find affection. And he showed her love, a love that no one else was giving to her. And this is where Jesus jumps into our story. It, it does so in a, in a couple ways. 
You know, I, I mentioned earlier that the Bible tells us, what have you done? This is a theme saying in the book of Genesis. And we've been all affected by the what have you done. We've said it. We've had it said to us. What have you done, Adam and Eve, when they tried to lie about the sin in the garden? What have you done, Cain, when I asked you about your brother Abel? What have you done is what Pharaoh said to Abraham when he said Sarah was his sister and failed to mention that she was his wife. It's the same thing Abimelech again said to Abraham for that very same issue. It's the same thing Abimelech said to Isaac when Isaac tried to do that with Rebekah. What have you done is what Laban will say to Jacob when he tries to take his daughters away in the middle of the night. What have you done? Isn't that what every girl wants to hear her husband say to her father-in-law the night after? What have you done? What have you done? And whether she was fully, this was her idea, or she was just swept along with the current, we see this what have you done has led to Judah, which eventually leads to David, which eventually leads to Jesus. And that's what the book of Genesis is looking for. Who's going to undo the what have you done? Who's going to be the one that's going to squash the serpent's head? Who's going to be the one that's going to offer forgiveness and redemption? Who's going to be the one that's going to deliver us from this evil age in which we are in and bring us to glory before the Father that we might dwell with him forever? It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus that our hope is. It's in Jesus that we are pointed to here as we look at Leah's life. You know, when when the Lord saw Leah, he saw a, a princess that was going to be in the line to give birth to our Messiah, our King, our Savior, Jesus. This is the one that we should hope in, the one where this story is going. But we also see it in another way. Everyone else saw Leah as an object of scorn, an object to be used. But God saw her as someone to be loved, And he chose her. He chose her especially. And we see that with Jesus, don't we? The blind man, Bartimaeus, sitting on the side of the road, everyone else looking over him, telling him to shut up. But Jesus saw him. Jesus saw him. Uh, There were the lepers that, that no one wanted to touch. But Jesus saw them. He saw them. The, the woman that lived out by Tyre, and all she wanted was the crumbs of God's grace. Jesus saw her. He, he saw the widow that had lost a son. He saw the man that had lost his daughter. Jesus saw these people that no one else saw. He saw these people that maybe had this hollowness inside of them that felt like that they weren't enough that society was casting them out, that they were the the dregs while everyone else was seemingly doing just fine. Jesus saw them. Has anyone here seen the show The Chosen? Maybe a few of you, The Chosen. I just love it. It's great. In the show The Chosen, they talk about Jesus' calling of Matthew, the tax collector. And in the show, they they give a lot more kind of color to Matthew's life. His parents have disowned him. The Jewish people hate him. The, The Romans, they're just using him. And there Matthew is, sitting in his booth, behind a metal lattice. And Jesus walks by. And he stops and he says, he goes, Matthew, son of Alphaeus, follow me. And Matthew goes, me, Lord? He said, yes, you. 
That's what the Lord says to us. So, what do we do with this? So, what do we do with this? I would argue that one of the things that we see in, at least in part, the story of Jacob, but also in what we understand about Leah, is probably this issue of shame. Right? This, this little voice that always tells us that, that we aren't enough. No. Uh, recently, you know, if you kind of, one way to sort it out is uh, shame and guilt. Guilt is, you know, something I have done something wrong. Shame is I am wrong. Right? That's a, a way to kind of distinguish between the two. And, and it, while it does have some useful purposes, it, it isn't so useful when it's the constant voice always whispering inside your ear that you're not enough, you're not enough, you're not enough. And we feel it at various points, right? Maybe before you have the big meeting, you didn't prepare enough, you're going to fail. Uh, maybe as you're, as you're sitting there and you're in a good season of life, don't enjoy this, it's just going to get bad tomorrow. Right? You, you come home and some comment is made and you, you instantly take it as, as a rejection, showing your own in inabilities, that, that you're not enough for this marriage and it creates distance, which, which makes it even harder than to engage with your family. Uh, and it doesn't, just, it doesn't just end in a voice. We, we often take action to deliver ourselves from this shame. This is uh, Kurt Thompson's book, The Soul of Shame. He, he writes about this person that pursued an affair in order to fill the hollowness. It was the only spot where this lady felt that she was enough, that she was actually loved and seen, that she knew it was wrong. And he says this, kind of touching on the affair, but also other things. The affair was in many respects the results uh, the result of shame as much as it was the cause. And that's how shame tends to work. We don't find ourselves shaming others loudly in the staff meeting, apart from our own shame telling us that we're not enough. We don't embezzle unless at some deep level we, we believe we are not enough without the money. We continually look at pornography in no small part as a coping mechanism for our own inadequacy that long precedes it. We don't avoid converse, hard conversations in our marriage without our conviction that we don't have what it takes to tolerate what will inevitably be said, which will lead to someone leaving, someone living out in words or actions that we are not enough. And I think in our passage... Not only do we see that voice of shame, we see some of the actions of Leah being a crazy woman, naming her kids and somehow boxing her husband in it so he would love her, and yet the Lord's goodness working in spite of that. So let me just give you some points. Is that we can listen to that little voice of shame put together these data points to tell us a story that we are not enough. Or we can instead listen to what the Lord has to say about his love for us. That it's not about Leah being enough, but it's about the Lord who loves her, the Lord who chose her, the, the Lord who, who picked her out to be someone special. And that's what we see in Jesus. We see God picking us, God loving us, God moving toward us, even if no one else does. We need to remind ourselves of a different story of what is true. Here in 1 John chapter 4, he says this, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. 
Uh, Again, here, verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know to, and come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And God is love. And whatever, whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this love is perfected within us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love, right? We show love. We're told to commanded to, to love. And, and we don't love because we are enough. We don't love because we have somehow this deep treasure within ourselves of goodness that we just want to disperse to the general population. It's not because we have been hurt or because we are done hurting other people. We, have, we love because he first loved us. And that's the gospel. And we need to remind ourselves of the good news of Jesus Christ. That if you're in Christ, God has has especially picked you out. Called you his own. Said you are lovely not, not because of your physical appearance or what others may or may not say. But because he's loved you. We need to live in that story. Another thing we need to do is to to be able to connect with other people, to be able to share and kind of get this stuff out into the open. What we see throughout the life of Jacob is deception and deceit. There's not only evil, but it's, it's hidden in lies. It's operating in the shadows. The Bible tells us that we should confess our sins one to another, and we need to be Uh, vulnerable and open with each other. And I pray that you'd be able to find a relationship where you can kind of connect with someone to be able to share what's going on in your life. And if you need help doing that, you can reach out to me and we can start a path on what this might look like. But oftentimes, uh, shame operates because it's the little voice that no one else is speaking into. (laughs) And when we can say, no, I'm not going to listen to that. Instead, I want to listen to what God says. That's when life begins to change. It's good for us to live and to walk in the light and to see that God loves us. As the worship team comes forward, and give another quote from our friend Kurt here. He says this about our relationship with Jesus. He says, our relationship with Jesus is as much about being known as it is about knowing. And I think for those of us that know Christ, we, we understand that. We're always encouraging one another to know Christ. If we're in Christ, we need to also encourage each other with the words that we are actually known by him. That God knows us. And he sees us. And he's redeemed us. And he's calling us our own. And he says, we soon learn that life with God is not about being right, but it's about being loved. Let us pray. Father, I pray today that as Leah was the girl that nobody wanted, the girl that nobody loved, that if someone is sitting out there now and they feel like a Leah, someone that nobody loves, someone that nobody wants, Lord, I pray that they would see that that you see them, that you know them, In Christ is the fullness of hope and redemption. That that in Christ there is is not only new life, but a new identity. That that in you, O Lord, while while friends and family may fail us, riches, they, they come and go, but Lord, you are with us wherever we are at. And I pray for those out there now that are hurting. I pray you'd be their comfort. I pray for those that are wondering where, how the bills are going to be paid, that that you would be their provision. Lord, I I pray for those that are wondering what the future may hold with with health or relationships. Lord, that you would be their stability. And Lord, that, that they would know that you know tomorrow even if we don't. 
Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would demonstrate your goodness and grace to a lost and hurting world. Lord, I pray that that we would be a light here in this community for your name and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.